Heavenly Father, I come Don't have much to offer, Holy One I'm humbled by all that you've done And even though I walk through the valley I don't have to fear You have called me from my sorrow to gladness I have you What more could I want? So raise my faith a little higher Set my spirit on fire Lord, we're asking you to move You're the God of restoration The one who brings salvation Oh, let revival come let revival come oh, 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 oh. Mm -hmm. You are the God who calms the sea The very same God who healeth me You are the one who makes me strong Even though I walk through the valley well, I don't have to fear No, 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 no You've called me from my sorrow to gladness I have you What more could I want To raise my faith a little higher You set my spirit on fire Lord, we're asking you to move you're the God of restoration, the one who brings salvation. Oh, let revival come, let revival come. Revive me, revive me with joy that you bring, joy that you bring. Revive me, revive me with joy that you bring, joy that you bring. Revive me, revive me with joy that you bring, joy that you bring. Revive me, revive me with joy. So now my faith is a fire. You set my spirit on fire. Lord, we rise, can you to move? You're the God of restoration, the one who brings salvation. Oh, let me. Now my faith is up higher You set my spirit on fire Lord, we're asking you to move You're the God of resurrection One day you'll come back again Oh, so let revival come Let revival come Revive me, revive me with Joy that you bring, joy that you bring Revive me, revive me with joy that you bring, joy that you bring. Revive me, revive me with joy that you bring, joy that you bring. Revive me, revive me with joy that you bring. Amen. Amen. Is that your prayer today? That God brings revival to this place. That God brings the Holy Spirit right here in the midst of what we're doing. I hope that that excites you as much as it does me today. Let's stand as we begin to worship today. Oh, well, let's read a word of scripture together today. Here we go. Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What a great word of scripture. Today's Easter is the greatest event in the history of mankind. And we are right here in this place today to celebrate it, amen? Let's sing together. I was buried beneath 
my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive all my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Till I met you Out of the darkness Into your glorious day you called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Come on, put your hands together Now your mercy has saved my soul
invisible above, in beauty glorified. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for Thou hast died for me. Thy praise and glory shall not fail throughout eternity. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for Thou hast died for me. Thy praise and glory shall not fail throughout eternity. Amen. Yeah. Are you glad to be here today? Are you glad to be here celebrating this Easter Sunday morning? Amen. We're glad that you're here. We want to make you feel at home. That doesn't mean that you can just sit back and relax and don't do anything. We want you to participate. We want you to sing. Clap your hands just like you've been doing. But we want to make you feel at home. Whether you've been here for years or if this is your first time here, we want to make you feel at home. We just ask, there's one thing that we ask of you, and if you, uh, this is your very first time here, just pull out a card in the pew in front of you and fill that out, or you can fill out the exact same information by pulling out your phone and texting the word welcome uh, to this number that's up on the screen. And again, we just want a little bit of information from you. And if this is your first time here, we've got a gift for you back here at this welcome uh, center back here. It's the greatest coffee mug that you've ever had in your entire life. Like, it's my favorite coffee mug. And if you want that coffee mug, it's right out there. Now, if you've been here for years, don't go grab one. This is for first-time visitors only, okay? Um, and, uh, but we would love for you to have one. Well, we want to continue to worship here this morning. And so as we continue to listen to Scripture and sing, sing out, participate, and look to the Lord this morning. But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He has risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. Then they remembered that he had said this, so they rushed back from the tomb to tell his eleven disciples and everyone else what had happened. Amen. Yeah. Continue to sing with us this morning. That lay between us How high the mountain I could not hide In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name Into the night And through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. So great a mercy, but heart could fathom such boundless grace. The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken. Hallelujah, praise the one who 
upon me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my Lord. Salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. How long a the roaring lion declare great has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. In your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ. this morning. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing Your praise. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord our God. Then Sing it out.
Lord, we are thankful for you today. Jesus, no one in this world could have ever done what you did for us. And as we stand here today to celebrate what I called earlier the greatest event in the history of mankind, Lord, we are in awe of you. We're in awe of you, Father, for sending your Son to die, to live a perfect life, and to die on a cross. But God, we're thankful that it didn't stop there. We have what no other faith or religion in this world can claim. And that's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. And for that today, Father, we are thankful. So as we stand here today, we give all honor and glory to you. As we stand in awe of the God who created this world and sent his son. Jesus, thank you for what you did for us. In your holy name that we pray, amen. Amen. Be seated. <clears throat> well, I was out at the Hobby Lobby parking lot this morning about seven. I didn't see any of you knuckleheads. I got the instruction wrong. I guess we were going back out there, but none of you like waking up that early. You know, I got to admit, last year was kind of nice because by 8.30, I was home eating breakfast and we had this long day ahead, uh, but not, uh, not so uh, this way. Had a great group at the early service today. Uh, we're glad you're here with us in this service this morning. Turn in your Bible, Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. We've been, uh, this is our 29th week in the book of Revelation, we looked at chapters 2 and 3 uh, at the end of the summer and throughout the fall, and then in January, we picked up in chapter 4, and we'll wrap up uh, through chapter 5 this morning, and here's, here's where it all comes together. Uh, on this Easter Sunday, it's important for us to know this, the person and the power of the resurrection enables the purpose of revelation to be accomplished. The person and the power of this day, of the resurrection, enable the promises of this book to be fulfilled. If not, you folks are wasting your time, truly. But because of who Jesus is, and because of the power of God that makes today, today, really going all the way back to creation, because of the power of God that makes creation, but God makes this the resurrection day, a day we celebrate. And really, you know, it, it's, it's not just today on Easter Sunday. And it's a great thing to celebrate. And I'm glad you're here with us to worship. But as followers of Jesus Christ, every day is resurrection day. Because we live in that reality of having a living Savior. As Ryan just prayed, every other religion can claim all of these various benefits. But not one other faith claims a founder who is alive eternally. We don't just claim it, we know it because of Jesus and his word and his promises are fulfilled in this book. Uh, this book of the Revelation is so challenging. It is probably, well, without a doubt, I guess you would say, it is the most suspenseful of the 66 books contained within Scripture. There's just so much there and so much that we don't fully understand. And I, I was visiting with somebody earlier in between services, and it hit me. I thought, you know, uh, Revelation 2, 3, 4, and 5, it's taken me 29 weeks to get through these four chapters, and that's the easy part of the book. So I just, you know, probably Jesus will come back before I can ever work all the way through this book. But here's where we've been in chapters 4 and chapter 5. Just try to picture it with me. If you haven't been here or if you have, kind of pull all these thoughts together. Uh, because this is a revelation that God gave to John, the apostle John, the youngest of Jesus' uh, disciples. He's also the one, uh, the gospel writer, who wrote the gospel of John that the Holy Spirit inspired to him. And this vision is given to him, and he is caught up to heaven to see through an open door into heaven. 
And as he gazes into heaven, he sees these remarkable things that we've been trying to parse and understand and look at. He sees these angels, and not just a few angels. He sees tens of thousands of angels. We'll read about that here in just a moment. But he sees these thousands and thousands of angels that are present there in this glimpse of heaven. And there he sees also the four creatures representing uh, all of creation and man and all of, all of God's creation. They're there, and John sees these around the throne, and these are things that are, that are there now in some ways and things that will be taking place after the rapture because the rapture takes place right before chapter uh, 4 begins. And so this vision he gets is when the church is gathered, and that's who else is there. So you got uh, the uh, angels who are there, the creatures are there, and then you also have the elders, the 24 elders who are there. Now we asked this question for a couple of weeks a while back, who are the 24 elders? Are they 24 specific people uh, that we can know from Scripture who those 24 are? Or are the 24 representative of uh, priestly Old Testament tribes? Are the 24 uh, symbolizing all of the followers of Jesus Christ? Yes, is the answer to that. Yes and and yes. One of those things is probably right. Here's what we do know. We do know for sure the last thing is right, is that this picture we have is that these elders mean that all followers of Jesus Christ are, are there around a throne. And that's the other thing that John sees. He sees the throne of God. And as he sees the throne of God, he sees something that is is, uh, indescribable, essentially, because uh, he he sees these these colors that are there uh, around the throne, the sea of glass. He hears these sounds that are coming from the throne itself. And then he sees this picture, not a picture, but he sees the Father on the throne, and he sees this emerald in appearance that he can't, he really can't even describe it because God is indescribable. And John is getting this glimpse of all that is taking place in heaven. Well, that's not all, because then he sees a familiar face. Then he sees Jesus. Say, why is that familiar? We know that's familiar because John was one of Jesus' disciples, one of the 12 who was with him all the time. John saw this face, Jesus, in the upper room on the night before his betrayal. John saw him there. John was there in the garden when Jesus was arrested. John likely was was watching as Jesus was persecuted and whipped and beaten. John was there at the foot of the cross by Mary, the mother of Jesus. Do you remember? This same John, the revelator, this same one that uh, to whom God gives this vision of of what heaven is uh, going to be like and what is already taking place in heaven. He was there as Jesus was on the cross. But that's not all that John saw. There's something that John didn't see. Because John was with Peter at the empty tomb when he didn't see Jesus. This one that he had watched him suffer and he watched him die. And then they go to the tomb because the, the ladies had gone earlier and said, he's not here. And so, so Peter and John hustle up and, and they go and they realize that he's not there. But then later that evening, still Easter Sunday, that first resurrection day, that's why, by the way, we worship on Sunday, the first day of the week, a day to celebrate the victory we have in Christ because of the resurrection But later that evening, the followers of Jesus were hiding out. Well, here's why they were hiding out. Because they thought, or not just they thought, but the the Romans and other authorities, the Jewish leaders, thought that the followers of Jesus had stolen the body of Jesus. And so they were looking for him. And the followers were scared. And so they're, they're all hemmed up, closed up in this room. And then Jesus shows up. Jesus, the one that 
he had seen die on the cross, the one that likely he was there when Joseph laid him in this borrowed tomb, and Jesus, the one who was not there that morning, and all of a sudden he shows up and he appears to his followers, and John was there when Jesus showed them the nail prints in his hands, and they saw this body that had been beaten, this same John who now is caught up into heaven, and he is seeing this Savior that he knows oh so well. Why John? Why does John get this vision of heaven and not some of the others? Well, as we read through the Gospels, we see a lot of times John is referred to as the other disciple. It was Peter and that other disciple, or the disciple that Jesus loved, or the younger disciple. A lot of times when we see some of the other disciples' names given, John's name's not mentioned. I wonder why that is. Maybe he was younger, he was less prominent maybe than some of those like Peter that was uh, uh, loud and kind of boisterous. Could it be that John was humble and took a back seat when some of the others were always kind of up front? Could it be that God rewards John by giving him this vision we see in the Revelation because he was faithful through thick and thin. When we know during some of the suffering and the crucifixion itself that Peter, even, Peter even denies Christ. And a lot of the others, they hightailed it out of there. They're hiding out. But John was there with the mother of Jesus. So is that why maybe John's given this vision that we find here in Revelation? We don't know exactly all the answers to that. We can kind of guess at what some of it is, but we know that John is rewarded. He is blessed by what God gives him that we find here in this last book of the Bible. But look with me in chapter 5, verse 11. I want to read verses 11 through 14 this morning. And we see what we see the, the two things that, that stick out. Uh, if you will, that I mentioned earlier. We see the person of the resurrection, then we see the power of the resurrection in these two uh, choruses of praise and worship that are taking place. Verse 11, Revelation chapter 5 says, And I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads, or tens of thousands and tens of thousands, and thousands and thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four creatures kept saying, amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. Isn't that good? And then all of a sudden, the page turns, you get to chapter 6, and these seals start coming off, and the scroll starts opening, and the events that we really have a hard time trying to understand what all is going to take place, and then it all comes about. But all of those things that God uh, has, has given in this prophecy, all these things that are promised to come, they are dependent upon the person and the power of Resurrection Day. The person and the power of Resurrection Day. So how is it that the one crucified in Jerusalem is now seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven? How is it that this one that John saw, he, he walked with him and he talked with him. He saw him uh, in the garden. He had seen him at supper the night uh, just hours before that. He saw him in the garden. He saw him suffering. He saw him on the cross. Then he saw him in that room the night after he, he came back to life. And Jesus had promised them, his followers, that he was going to come back to life. But listen, if any of you people tell me that you're going to die and you're going to come back to life, I'm not going to believe you either. They didn't believe him. Because they had, no, they had no frame of reference. It's not that they didn't think he was significant. 
It's not that they didn't think that he was other than them, that he was something that they weren't. They, they appreciated all of that stuff. But they didn't have any understanding like we have that he really was coming back to life. How is all of this possible? This one that John had seen here on earth in Jerusalem, now seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Uh, the answer is a twofold, the person and the power first, because of the lamb that was slain. Because the lamb that was slain was a spotless sacrifice. A lamb without sin, without blemish. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 tells us this about Jesus that enabled Jesus to fulfill this role as the sacrificial lamb. It says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God made him, Jesus, to be sin. Think about that. He was God. He's fully God. He's in heaven with God. And then he comes to earth and becomes sin. And he had never sinned. That's what enabled Jesus to be the perfect, required, necessary sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Just write these references down if you're taking notes. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 says, Jesus had by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. Jesus had by himself purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. It tells us this, that Jesus was sacrificed not with only a little sin, but he was sacrificed with no sin. Sinless Savior. Had he not been sinless, he could have never been the substitutionary atonement for our sin. Had Jesus not been sinless, we wouldn't be here today. There's no other that could have ever done that because the Bible tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. That everyone has sinned but Jesus, for he knew no sin. And then we find this, that Jesus was sacrificed not with any of our help. That Hebrews 1, 3 says that Jesus had by himself purged our sin. Let me let you in on a secret. God doesn't need your help. He doesn't need your help to forgive your sin. Say, well, what's the whole point of going to church? <laughs> what's the whole point of obeying? We worship because he's worthy of our worship. We obey because he deserves our obedience. Look what he did for us. So our worship, our spiritual obedience is not out of a have to, it's out of a want to. Because if you know him, if you know who he is and what he did for you, you want to serve him. You want to worship him. You want to support the, the things of God and you want that to, to be the driving force of your life. But Jesus was sacrificed not with any of our help, but we know Jesus was sacrificed all by himself. He by himself purged our sin. We also know this, we talked about a couple of weeks ago that in chapter five, verse nine, this same lamb, this same lamb that was slain purchased salvation by his blood for every nation, tongue, tribe, and people. Meaning that when Jesus died, he made salvation available for all people. Now, not automatic, there's some people that say, well, that means that everybody's saved, everybody gets to go to heaven. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible teaches us that you, take, you have to have personal faith, each individually trust him, but he made salvation available to those who will trust him when he gave his life by his blood for every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So Jesus, this uh, lamb that was slain, is in heaven because of his sinless sacrifice the person of the resurrection but then we also see the power of the resurrection because the power is seated on the throne 
the power of God seated on the throne because the Father seated on his throne by his power and authority raised Jesus from the dead and in that same power and authority he will fulfill these promises of the revelation. You got to get this, that God raised Jesus from the dead. Now, sometimes we say, look what Jesus did for himself. And if, if that's your, your picture of what Resurrection Day is all about, is that Jesus was so strong, he brought himself back to life. That's not what it says. It says the Father's power raised him from the dead. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. Ephesians 1, verse 19 through 21 says, That power is the same as the mighty strength that he, meaning the Father, exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Understand the the big picture here, that when Jesus came to earth, he came and and he he gave up his, his power. He performed miracles by faith in God and God worked through him. But when he went to the cross, as uh, Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, it says he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Jesus relinquished his power. And so he is laying stone cold dead in the tomb. Don't miss out on that. He is dead as dead can be. And then God exerted his power and raised Jesus back to life. The promises of the revelation are reality, will be reality for us because of the person of the resurrection, the lamb that was slain, and because the power of God exerted to raise Jesus from the grave. So this morning, I just want to ask two questions, two questions, and, you know, happy Easter. I might even let you out on time, or early. Two questions. Here's the first one. Is your life without sin? I asked the folks at the early service, and there was not a sinless one in the crowd that wanted to come up and admit that they were sinless Looking at some of you, I better not ask this question. Is your life without sin? Of course not. Of course not. That's why we needed a Savior. That's why we needed a spotless lamb without blemish to be the sacrifice to pay the penalty for our sin because heaven is a perfect place. As we've studied and read through this picture of heaven in uh, chapter 4 in particular, we see that heaven is a place where there is no sin. So that makes it a little difficult. If Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, so how can we who have sinned and fallen short of God make it to heaven where there is no sin? We needed a Savior. We needed a sacrifice whose name is Jesus. When we consider the sacrifice that he made for us, we have to think about this. The excellence of our reputation does not matter. When you ask a question like, is your life without sin? A lot of people will say this. No, but I'm not that bad. I mean, no, I'm not perfect, but I'm better than that guy. I started to point at a couple of you. (laughs) The excellence of our reputation can never earn heaven for us. You get that? You can never be good enough. You can never be thought of highly enough. But you know how we do. We say, oh, I know so-and-so. If anybody's going to get to heaven, he's going to get to heaven because he's a good guy. Or you know what we say? We say, he's good people. He might be, but that's not going to get him to heaven. The excellence of our reputation will never get us to heaven. We needed a Savior. The efforts of our religion do not matter. 
The efforts of our religion do not matter. Let me, let me explain something to you. There's a difference between religion and relationship. Religion is what man does trying to earn his or her way to God. If I can be spiritual enough, if I can do these spiritual sounding church things, if I can go through these rituals or, or habits or, or whatever, if I do enough of these religious things, then surely God will have pity on me. That's not how it works. No matter how good we are, we can never earn our way to God, but God gave himself for us. Religion is about us trying to climb a stairway to heaven, if you will, trying to get closer to God. But Christianity, what the Bible teaches, is about God humbling himself and coming to earth for us. So our security, our hope, the living hope that we sang about a little while ago, it's because God came to us not because we're trying to get our way to him. And then third, and this is kind of the opposite direction, but the enormity of our transgressions does not matter. The enormity of our transgressions doesn't matter. The enormity of our sin. See, not only can you not be good enough to earn heaven, you also can't be bad enough that God won't forgive you. Just think of the, boy, I sure don't want you to call out an answer to this, but think of the worst thing that you ever did. Think of the absolute worst thing that you ever did. It's not so bad that the blood of Jesus doesn't cover it. The enormity of our sin will not keep us out of heaven. The efforts of our religion cannot get us there. The excellence of our reputation cannot get us there. That's why we need a Savior. And this morning, if you're here on Easter Sunday because you heard that's what you do on Easter Sunday, you go to church. But if there's never been a time in your life where you personally said, I need Jesus, I can't do this on my own. Look at my life. I'm a pretty good guy, but I still got things that are messed up. I need a sinless Savior to forgive my sin. That's the only response that yields eternal life. The only way you'll be gathered with those elders around the throne of God is if you humble yourself and say, God, I know I can't save myself, but you can save me because of what Jesus did and because of your power. And so I give you my life. I trust you. But here's a second question that's important for you to to consider also. Do you allow the Father, remember we talked about the person and the power of the resurrection. Do you allow the Father, Almighty God, to be seated on the throne of lordship in your life? One thing that I mentioned for several weeks is that the throne of God will not be established in heaven because it already is. It will not become established. That's not something that will take place in the future. It already is. See, that's what enabled the power of God to raise Jesus from the dead. And that shows us that not only is the power of God something that we will see and recognize when we go to heaven, but he wants us just as this uh, one of these, these refrains, these courses says, uh, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. So to him who sits on the throne, be blessing and honor. He is worthy of our lives submitted to his lordship. So the question is, do you allow the Father to be seated on the throne of authority in your life? Say, well, I believe in the resurrection. Do you? If you genuinely, personally believe that all this took place, that God by his power raised Jesus from the dead, then shouldn't you trust God with the details of tomorrow? 
if you believe that the things written in this book have happened and the things, they're going to happen, shouldn't you trust him with some of those unknowns that you're facing? Shouldn't you say, God, I want to know what you want in this relationship? Not only the relationship I have with you, but the relationship with this person. God, I want to be under your authority in my life, so show me your truth in order that I may live in a way that brings honor and glory and reverence to you. So see, the resurrection, the power and the purpose of the resurrection, it matters not just on Easter Sunday. It matters every day. I mean, it matters every day. Does it matter to you? 